on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The northeastern forests were earthworm free. That was a good thing. But Europeans came in and said, oh, these are soils. They don't have any earthworms. We need to better the soil. When I'm visiting little trout streams, I'll see discarded, empty earthworm containers. I think the people assume that the earthworms are fine, if not even maybe beneficial, so they just toss them out. Recreational hunting does nothing to, to the deer herd. I think we need to go back to regulated market hunting so people have an incentive to go out and do that. We tend to imagine that there would be less deer now than there was pre-Columbus, which isn't true. And it almost seems like what we've done is grown deer at the expense of the rest of the ecosystem. I don't blame the deer for it. It's our making. Deer are wonderful critters. I love to watch them. I love to observe them. They are charismatic. They're beautiful. They're tasty. All of those things all at the same time. Episode 161 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Too Many Deer, Too Many Earthworms with Dr. Bernd Blasi is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Man, I'm excited to introduce a new product at SirThrival.com. We've teamed up with Hammond's Black Walnuts, and after a year of behind-the-scenes work, I'm proud to finally introduce Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder. This is the most exciting new product I've seen in my 15 years in the health food and nutritional supplement industry. I've been using it for over six months every morning in my smoothie and loving it more each day. It fortifies my blended drinks with 17 grams of wild protein per scoop. But the story is even more incredible because the black walnuts in our protein powder are hand foraged from wild native trees. There's no fertilizer, no irrigation, no pesticides used anywhere in the process. No agricultural land is used either, so no habitat is disrupted to produce these nuts. All the foragers are volunteers paid by the pound for their harvests. In other words, when you invest in Sir Thrival's black walnut protein powder, it's not just an investment in your health. You're investing in wild lands, wild species, healthy ecosystems, and the people who tend to them. I can honestly say it's hands down the most ethically sourced and produced protein product ever made. It's also the cleanest because we use the same ultra pure CO2 extraction process used in high end cannabis extracts. This yields a light colored raw protein powder far superior to the ones made with higher heat expeller pressing. It's a very fine flour too, so we've used it in more than just smoothies. My wife's been baking it into cookies and muffins, turning them into wild protein fortified snacks, and she uses it in her oatmeal at breakfast too. I'm excited to see all the recipes you come up with using this really versatile ingredient. Wild North American native trees, 100% grown and processed in the USA. Sometimes it feels too good to be true. We've managed to bring a wild, hand-foraged, native North American food to people in a format they can easily use to fortify their diets daily. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire product line and use the coupon code WILDFED to get an additional 5% off your order. Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder, the first wild protein powder on the market ever. Do you need an antidote to the metaverse? We just launched our newest t-shirt design over at wild-fed.com. It features our antidote to the metaverse tagline on the chest, a wild fed badge on the sleeve, and two tarot style cards juxtaposed on the back, one modeled on the tarot card known as the fool, who's wearing an oculus and absentmindedly walking off the roof of a building with a bag of fast food in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Next to it is a card based on the magician who's juggling four implements, a fishing rod, a rifle, a trap, and a foraging basket. It represents our belief that a life that includes the outdoors inoculates you against believing that an artificial experience of life could ever replace a natural one. You see, for us, being wild-fed, hunting, fishing, and foraging is about a lot more than just getting our groceries. It's an antidote to the metaverse, an act of rebellion against the transhuman agenda that is leading humanity to abandon the natural world in favor of wearing screens over their eyes to live in a virtual one. We choose the natural over the artificial. We choose an antidote to the metaverse. We choose to be fed by the wild. Check out our new shirt at wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food 
is all around you. I've got a really important episode for you today, at least important to me and probably to you too if you've been listening to this show for a while. In fact, in some ways, it feels like it helps to make sense of a couple of important themes we've explored again and again here over the last 160 episodes, most notably those of wild game conservation, who funds it and where its efforts have been focused, as well as invasive species and in particular how significant the threat from them is, how we could or should be dealing with them, and what feedback loops we may be creating through our attempted conservation efforts. The interview is with Dr. Berend Blossy, who specializes in the intersection between white-tailed deer and their high populations, invasive earthworms in North America, and invasive plant species, and how the three of these factors intersect, overlap, and exacerbate the issues that each individually creates on the landscape. Basically, it's like the title says, too many deer, too many earthworms. Specifically, too many white-tailed deer on our landscape, far more than can sustainably be supported by our ecosystems, and the invasion of earthworms beneath our feet in North America, most of which are not native here since the last glaciation pushed all the worms back to the deep southern United States. There was, after all, two miles of ice covering the land that is now home to our northern forests. When those forests regrew, they did so in the absence of earthworms, and the worms that are here now are not just exotic but extremely deleterious to those forests and many of the native plant species that live there. These two factors, overpopulated white-tailed deer from above and exotic earthworms from below, might be influencing the spread of invasive plant species in ways that aren't readily apparent to the untrained observer. But Dr. Berend Blossy, a professor who heads up the Ecology and Management of Invasive Plants program at Cornell, is going to pick that apart for us today, helping to make sense of the data. He's also a hunter himself, so his view of conservation is informed from an inside perspective. The conclusion I've walked away with is that a lot of what we've been calling conservation in the hunting community has really been about creating sufficient deer hunting opportunities. And that makes sense since it's been hunters footing the conservation bill over the years, but high deer numbers aren't synonymous with healthy ecology, and we may have reached and exceeded the ecological carrying capacity for white-tailed deer in much of the country. This might be a welcomed problem were it not for the devastating consequences it's having on our flora and in particular how it might contribute to the spread of deleterious exotic species. Like a lot of us, Dr. Blossy likes to hunt and eat whitetails, so he's sympathetic to our desire to have ample opportunities. But after listening, one can't help thinking we need a more holistic approach to conservation in North America. And one that, and I say this a little begrudgingly, brings more than just hunter voices to the table. After several years of actively exploring these issues like it's my job, because in many ways it is, I feel that this conversation has been a missing piece of the puzzle. Certain things just weren't adding up for me. But this information's already changing the way I look at the landscape and our role as hunters. I hope you find it as eye-opening as I have. Dr. Baron Blasi, welcome to the show. Thank you. You have such an interesting uh, area of focus in your work. I was uh, hoping we could start off. Maybe you could just sort of tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then I can't wait to dig into your uh, research. Okay. Uh, It's a little convoluted, but it all makes sense for me, I guess. Um, I'm an entomologist by training, and I grew up in Germany. Um, And I came over with a project that I was uh, participating in, which was developing biocontrol for purple loose strife, uh, which was an invasive wetland plant. And I got uh, stuck in quotation mark here at Cornell, like in what I was able to do here. And uh, a major focus of mine was trying to understand what uh, introduced plants do and how we can manage them better. And uh, once I ventured out from wetlands into forests, other plants came onto my agenda. And then increasingly the insights that we developed over time that without earthworm uh, recognition and what they do and deer control, there wouldn't be any conservation that we could do in eastern forests and over much of the U.S. So um, maybe a little bit over the last 10, 12 years, I have come to not only enjoy deer as table fare, but also as a subject <laughs> of, my, of my scientific investigation. So uh, trying to help communities that struggle with uh, their populations that are extraordinarily high with impacts on Lyme disease or vegetation or so. That's that's kind of where I live. I'm still doing some entomology, but I'm, I'm a generalist really in my approach, but 
one of the luxuries that I have here in my position at Cornell is that I can follow my nose and my intuition when they're, where the data leave me or lead me, not leave me. <laughs> they never leave me. <laughs> not yet, not yet. That would, that would be bad. <laughs> and so I can reorient and reposition my program uh, in the way that I see most fit and, and everything is driven by my interest in, in conservation, really. That's the, that's the big deal. Okay. And I'm going to try to pick that apart a little bit. There's a few things there. One, go, go uh, of course, we, a lot of us, uh, a lot of our listeners are going to be very familiar with um, some of the exotic, you know, deleterious invasive plants. Um, you know, in particular, uh, I've seen uh, a lecture of yours, you were talking about Japanese knotweed, which is a constant concern up here. Um, you know, I'm in Maine, you're in New York so, state. So, um, you know, I heard you mention Phragmites. Uh, you know, these are things that we're familiar with. But I think for a lot of our listeners and a lot of the public at large, the idea that most of the northern tier of North America's earthworms are non-native comes as a bit of a shock. I think that that's a, that's a suite of species that people have such positive associations to when it comes to soil and soil health. And, and yeah. so that can be a bit of a shock. So I wonder if we could pick that apart. And then lastly, um, while our lovely white-tailed deer are definitely not an invasive species or, or, sorry, an exotic species, I think that the, the constant focus on them as the uh, sort of poster child for conservation might be a little misguided. And uh, I was at a National Wild Turkey Federation meeting the other day. Somebody described deer as the cockroaches of conservation. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I an don't, unpopular... I don't want to go there for many different reasons, but let's... Yeah. Let's try to unpack the earthworm story a little bit. Please, I wasn't aware that the earthworms were introduced here until we started a big project on garlic mustard and barberry and, and honeysuckles uh, and how that would uh, affect uh, salamander populations. And I always remembered my association was I went to the boundary waters with friends, go canoeing and go fishing. And I hated the idea that we couldn't find any earthworms around the boundary <laughs> waters because we had to drag in bait and and, and, and catch bait fish oh, for us to yeah. do things. And said, what the hell is going on? Um, and then I learned that that was a good thing, actually. Um, and so, yes, indeed, um, much of the northeastern forest all the way down to you know, maybe even Pennsylvania and Maryland, after the last glaciation, they were earthworm free. Uh, earthworm were pushed to the south. There are native earthworms. We are encountering a few in very specialized habitats now that people focus on earthworms more uh, over the last two decades or so. Um, but Europeans came in and said, oh, these are soils. They don't have any earthworms. We need to better the soils because from the European context, uh, they knew that uh, good earthworm populations were increasing maybe productivity, particular in gardens or in agricultural areas. Um, but uh, northeastern hardwoods, uh, the decomposition of the leaf litter that was coming down, other organic materials, was all going through fungal decomposition. And so for people that want to experience what uh, an earthworm-free site looks like, and you may have quite a few still in, uh, in Maine, I, I don't know that, but you go through areas and you find that the soil is spongy and you sink in mm -hmm. and it's not a hard pan. That's what forest soil should be feeling like if you would. That you springy would that. duff layer. The springy duff layer, right? And it shouldn't be just the annual input of the litter that just fell in these last few weeks. Um, and then by the summer or early fall, most of that is gone. Um, since we're talking about, uh, you know, people maybe eating the things that they find wild, I know that um, uh, uh, ginseng hunters very often describe that they can feel that sometimes they take their shoes off to walk in air since I feel uh. where ginseng wants to be. And it's basically when you do not have earthworms, ginseng uh. do much better. Now, in Wisconsin, they grow under shade cloth in agricultural fields. So if you plant them, uh, they will grow there as well. But in the woods where you have naturally regenerating populations, they like a thick duff layer where they can put their rhizomes in. So that's the that's the big story. And so that's a pretty it, big story. I mean, yeah. And, and is it, it fair to say what what if I can just make sure yeah, I'm understanding you correctly? 
so whereas the earthworms are going to kind of eat their way through this duff layer, and that's how the forest floor gets, uh, I guess, composted, um, that's in contrast in areas where they're um, native. Here, the forest had adapted to fungal decomposition after the last glacial maximum. So that glacier retreats yep. back, and then these these many seasons layers of leaves just go through a fungal decomposition and the right. forest adapts to that. And then suddenly it's we slower. introduce these. It's okay. slower. Um, but uh, if we think about a lot of our native wildflowers and even the trees, they have their fine roots in this stuff layer. Mm. Uh, and it becomes bioavailable slowly over time. And it's being taken up a lot of the orchids, the trilliums, a lot of other wildflowers that are so charismatic in the North American um, forests, they have a very slow life cycle. Few seeds are being produced, but the plants live for a very, very long time. Mm. They live slow compared to like a hummingbird or a mouse that lives very fast, very uh, fast wing beat, or an annual species um, that produces a lot of seeds but dies very quickly. Mm -hmm. Our charismatic wildflowers, most of them are very, very long lived. They can live for decades or maybe even centuries. We don't hmm. know. And uh, not an individual tissue lives that long, but maybe an individual plant can live that long. So there are, in that uh, approach, there are similar to uh, to trees almost, right, that are that long lived. If we look at an, uh, a spring wildflower that's there for, uh, I don't know, two months or something like that, maybe three, uh, and then it's gone. And uh, we think that that's a fast life cycle. It's not. Those plants just sit there and wait for the next spring to come in and they need slow nutrient uptake, not the very fast junk food kind of deal that I would <laughs> say that, that the earthworms are providing. And so they change that entire thing from a fungal decomposition to a bacteria dominated decomposition. And so our native plants that need mycorrhizae and others are not uh, well suited for that fast life cycle. So, so, so the earthworms themselves are not having necessarily a mechanical effect. You know, it's not that they're eating the rhizomes of these plants they or disturbing them. They do that them. too. Okay. They do that too. So they, when you talk about a mechanical effect, what they're doing is uh, they're disturbing all those little layers that over time accumulate mm -hmm. uh, one season after the other of litter that then slowly goes from a leaf to what we call soil or so. Um, uh, they're eating that that up. By doing that, you get maybe root desiccation of the yeah. uh, of, of the plants. And if they have like bulbs or rhizomes or others overwintering structures that are typically found not that far below ground or in the duff layer, they're exposing that, and then you get into desiccation. So there's a there's a problem with that mechanical disturbance. Okay. And then the other part that they do, particular, you know, you have uh, one or two hillsides in Maine too. <laughs> so if you have the earthworms in the woods and they're materializing a lot of the leaf litter that quickly and make it into little earthworm pellets that come out of the business end of the earthworm and you get heavy rains, typically the duff layer would soak this all up and store it. When you have heavily earthworm infested area, you get a lot of erosion. So basically all the fertility is washed down into the rivers and creeks wow. and valley bottoms off the hillsides and you get, uh, you know, granite exposed or other under underlying oh. rock formations exposed. So, um, so there, there's, that's a mechanical disturbance in my sense too, even though it's not directly done by the earthworms, but the earthworm effect then uh, allows uh, rainwater and, and and storms and uh, you know snow melt to wash off the fertility into the into the wow. Mountains. So, so is, it's pretty is there dramatic. A, is is anything is it have anything to do with like um, I imagine each season's like another layer. It's like a lasagna, all laminar. Like that. <laughs> that's, a then, nice, that's a nice. That's a nice picture <laughs> for me. <laughs> trying to picture how it are, are the worms disturbing that? Is that yes. having an effect? Okay, so yes. they're sort of uh, and not only the top lasagna layer but all the layers down. Right. So if you go to an earthworm location, it looks almost like an agricultural field uh, where the top one foot or so of, the, uh, of soil and litter and humus is constantly being turned over, particular by what we call the nightcrawler. It's a lumbricus species that the Latin name 
Um, it's the one that goes and burrows deep. There are some species that live on the surface, but the night crawler goes down, has these burrows, comes back up. And so the entire soil is mixed. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes kind of like gray instead of having strata in the way that you described the lasagna, right? If the lasagna pieces would change color from light to dark as you go through that, uh, that's how soil should look like. We call it stratified. Um, and uh, so the earthworms are mixing all of that. Everything becomes mineral soil. Um, and the, the Europeans and gardeners would always say, hey, earthworms are aerating the soil. Actually, that's wrong in a forest context. If you drive heavy equipment over big cornfields or so, having some earthworms in there, yes, they will provide some force for <laughs> right. water infiltration and air to go in. But in a forest situation, that spongy thing that happens with lots of uh, mycelia of the fungi in there and the fungal decomposition, that's so much air that's stored in there, right? Mm. And holds the moisture. You get the earthworms in there, that collapses and becomes a hard pan. Okay. So the, in the okay. woods, the earthworms are not aerating the soil and making it easier for plants to grow. And then, uh, and then you end up with impression. a you end up with a bacterial dominance. So then, yeah. I imagine you lose a lot of the mycorrhizal associations. Yes. And then, are there pH changes or things like that that are yeah, caused by that bacteria? Yeah, the earthworms like to, um, and so it, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem um, that. Uh, we don't fully understand, but earthworm likes like a higher pH, uh, but they're also creating uh, a situation where higher pH is dominating. So uh, okay. they don't like oak woods, for example, right? So it's one is there's a lot of tannins in oak leaves yeah. or beech woods, and so they have a hard time processing that. Um, and um, and so, but there's a little bit earthworms are gardeners of the soil microorganisms a little bit because that's what they're ultimately eating. Um, and so they filter those, those things out. Um, okay. So they eat the soil only to extract out the microbes and yeah. then pass the soil. So you, many of your listeners may know what a whale shark is. Yeah. Uh, a whale shark will inhale a lot of water, right? But it's not the water that it's eating. It's the uh -huh. plankton that it yeah. tries to filter out. And so while the earthworms are not going through an aquatic suspension, they basically take all those little crumbly things of the... Uh, that's the that's called soil, and out they filter uh, the the little fungi and and bacteria and other things, and that's what they're eating. Actually, okay. that's their food. How widespread is this issue, and are there are we even at the point where we're looking at any kind of remedial actions, or is this like something that isn't even really on the radar of most mm -hmm. of the conservationists out there? Yet? No, I think it's on the radar now for a lot of people. It's widespread. It's throughout. The Northeast, Southeast, Midwest, um, Pacific Northwest. There's lots of lots of things that are going on. Uh, the distribution of introduced earthworms is basically all through North America. Um, How many species? Oh, I don't even know. Dozens of them. Uh, wow. There are Asian species. There are European species. Um, you may have heard about jumping worms. I don't know. Some of no. your listeners may have heard about I that. I haven't. They almost behave like garter snakes when you touch them. You oh. think about a typical earthworm, like a nightcrawler, it's kind of limp if you were to lift it up. It hangs <laughs> right. on both sides of your finger, right? Yeah. So these Asian ones, uh, uh, they're called jumping worms because they almost jump and wiggle very, uh, very fast. They're very turgid, uh, so uh, their body is almost hard. So if you were to put them on a finger and they would tolerate that, it would be almost like a straight line. <laughs> uh, and uh, and okay. they can grow, very, very many of them are annual worms. They're in Massachusetts, they're in Rhode Island, um, and they can grow up to a foot or longer within one season. So oh, you can wow. think about the voracious appetite that they that yeah. they are having. And so, depending on where you are, you have different uh, different compositions. But you go out to the Midwest and also the Pacific Northwest. They're very very specialized earthworms. We had a, a Palouse earthworm that now exists only in some refrigerators in the at the University of Idaho because everything <laughs> is under potato cultivation there now. Those were very, very big earthworms. And I had the pleasure of watching one <laughs> in a refrigerator for, for a while. They're still alive, but they're very few individuals, right? Because much of the prairie was plowed under. Yeah. And so we have threatened earthworms as well, in addition to these introduced and invasive ones. 
and remediation, there's nothing that we can do at the at the present time. There's a little bit of hope that there are some places that seem to be a resistant to earthworm invasion, even if they're all around you. We don't understand fully well how that works. Uh, they're becoming obviously part of food food webs and food chains. Yeah, um, turkeys will eat them. All kinds of other critters, you know. Hunters will know woodcock and grouse, or, or particularly woodcock, will eat earthworms. They weren't eating earthworms before the Europeans arrived. But they um, got that great beak adaptation. Yeah, right? of yeah. course. They were going down and taking taking other insect larvae or so. Um, that was fine. The big thing that people can do is prevent earthworm introductions in the first place. Okay. And so for us, that means don't bring in mulch from places that you do not know. Don't buy potted plants that come from New Jersey or <laughs> Connecticut or uh, even the Carolinas or so. They are loaded with these earthworms and you can't find them early on. Um, in our own woods, we only garden with seeds or bare root. Uh, you know, orchard yeah. things is a big thing in Maine, right? So right. people will buy, I don't know, maybe they buy, buy just rootstocks or sometimes they may be buying potted plants. We don't do that. Uh, around your garden, it may be okay, but in the woods, uh, bare root or seed, that's the only way to do. And, and washing down forestry equipment, that's how it comes into the woods. And wow. Once it's there, there's nothing that you can do uh, to uh, eliminate the earthworms other than controlling deer. Oh, yeah. I want to I get to that and how those interrelate. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, I've got some good news about the Wild Fed TV show. You can now stream both seasons one and two on demand at MyOutdoorTV.com. That's MyOutdoorTV.com. Com. My Outdoor TV is Outdoor Channel's premium online subscription service. They host thousands of episodes of hunting and fishing content, making this a great subscription service for anyone interested in the outdoors. But if you just want to see Wild Fed, grab yourself a free trial subscription and then check out all 20 episodes at no charge at all. If you decide to keep it, it's just $9.99 a month. We're currently in production for Season 3 of Wild Fed, which should start airing around the beginning of 2023. Hey, thanks again for all your incredible support. If you haven't already, I can't wait for you to see the show. But I, I wanted to ask a couple more questions. Yeah. And, and first, a statement. Um, I see a lot of times when I'm visiting little trout streams, and I'll see discarded, empty earthworm containers. You know, oh, folks boy. will pick them up yeah. for bait. And they'll fish for the day and then whatever they've got left, they just dump them out. And I think, you know, in addition to like, you know, you kind of like why throw plastic on the ground, you know, whatever people do that. But I think that people assume that the earthworms are fine, if not even maybe beneficial. Yeah. So they just yeah. toss them out, not realizing that they're introduced. That's one of the worst things that you can do if you want to th think about healthy landscape, healthy trout streams. Those trout streams will be very negatively affected if earthworms are all around them in the in the upstream one. If the sediment is washed down in the trout streams, oh, right. people will understand that's not a good thing, right? Right. All the little cribbly crawlies that may be making up uh, some trout food at some point, they live in the leaf litter layer. They're gone um, because the leaf litter disappears. So we know from, you know, remember the story of the boundary waters. We were never putting, uh, bringing in earthworms. We were putting, bringing in leeches. That was like kind of the favorite thing for right. my Minnesotan friends to bring in. Um, they knew what they were doing. And then we were catching minnows. Um, but in Canada and other places, discarded bait um, is one of the major entry points for introduced earthworms. So wow. please, those of your listeners that are fishermen, by all means, um, Take it back out if you have to fish with uh, uh, with earthworms. Yeah, um, it's uh, um, it's just not not good conservation. Uh, if right. we care about that, we shouldn't be doing that. What uh, one thing I I wanted to just kind of drive home too, um, because again, the common thinking is earthworms are so good for productivity of plants. But if I'm not mistaken, you showed a slide in one of your talks, um, kind of disproving that, at least as it relates to some of the things we're growing here. It, it's probably species dependent. There are some plants that really like earthworms, they, those with a fast life cycle or that can take up nutrients really well. Some of them are introduced plants. So we know, for example, garlic mustard uh, will only grow and expand in, in large populations where you have earthworms. 
um, microstegium, a thing that just comes, Japanese silkgrass that comes into Maine now, uh, is, is another species. There are some native species, some uh, ferns, uh, some grasses or sedges that will do better with earthworms. So it's really species specific. Species that don't have mycorrhizae and can do uh, take up nutrients very fast, they will do okay. It may even include some trees. So I can't say you have an earthworms, plants will do worse. That's not the case. So uh, it really depends on who you are and how you can deal with, with nutrient fluxes. Okay. And, and going back to what you said before is the earthworms liberate nutrients at a faster rate. Yes. Okay. So you're going to have, so plants that can take advantage of that then are going to outcompete. Some of those are, are exotic non-natives though. So yep. there's a, a relationship here where, yep. and you know, it took me a while to really understand in this conversation around invasive species, just how widespread the application of things like glyphosate have been in an attempt to deal with, um, these, these so-called invasions. So you end up with this question of like, Hey, what's worse for the landscape, you know, garlic mustard or glyphosate. Uh, I always find that yeah, to be this, really, in this case, it's very clear as glyphosate. So, so there, there's no question about that. Right. I would agree. So, but, but if, if one didn't understand that there was an underlying factor of earthworms, then you could go on just topically treating at a surface level, but not realize that underneath that there's a secondary invasion that actually is yeah, and so the, 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 the situation with garlic mustard is even more complicated. And so um, I started looking into garlic mustard when people wanted me to do biocontrol for garlic mustard. Um, and so I Can you describe into, what that means, biocontrol? Biocontrol is what we did with Purple Loose Drive. We were going to the native range, and then we were studying insects in particular and seeing whether they would be very specific to that plant. And then uh, we would do a whole bunch of tests and trying to see whether we would get an, an introduction permit for them to then um, basically be the natural enemy of this introduced species, uh, which they'd largely leave at home, right? So plants arrive here without their natural enemies and then become very competitive. And we tried that for, we didn't try it, but we researched it for garlic mustard. And But, but my experience showed that, hey, if you leave garlic mustard alone, it will go away by itself. Mm. It will go away by itself even faster if you do deer control and uh, and it will not really establish where you have no earthworms. So um, we figured out why that was uh, for garlic mustard, but there, because there is something that, I don't know whether your listeners will know what negative soil feedback is, uh, but many of your listeners may be gardeners as well. And so we know that we wouldn't put tomatoes after potatoes or potatoes after tomatoes all in the nightshade family. So we do rotation. Uh, mm. And it's not because the soil loses nutrients or so, but every plant species creates its own little root zone and favors certain microorganisms in, in that soil zone. Uh, and in many instances, when that is a negative feedback, we call it negative soil feedback. Mm -hmm. And so garlic mustard does that. And so over time, it takes maybe five, six, seven, ten years garlic mustard builds up suppressive soils that selectively suppress garlic mustard, not other plants, <laughs> but just garlic mustard. Just itself. Just itself. Wow. Uh, Why would so it do that? You, uh, well, uh, plants move around, right? Mm -hmm. Garlic mustard is a biennial, so it produces lots of seed, uh, goes to new places, and, and right. does that. Annual species, you know, they grow on exposed soil. You have a little grass that grows over it, something else, and your uh, species can't deal with that. There's a certain mm -hmm. life strategy behind it that, that is successful. So for garlic mustard, if you go in, you spray, you cut, you pull, you just perpetuate garlic right. mustard populations. Leave it alone, reduce the deer abundance, and garlic mustard will just go away by itself. It's fine. Um, it will still go to places where it hasn't been, right? Because it's like a... Um, stone that you put into throw into a pond, you're gonna get a wave, and the center where you put that rock in it, <laughs> it's quiet again. But the wave is still going outwards, right. right? So we will see that. So it's a little complicated for people, 
to to grapple with that. But garlic mustard also is not a major problem in the forest. It's the deer that eat the native vegetation. Uh, so leave garlic mustard alone. Um, that's my recommendation. And I know it's not going to sit well with a lot of people. That <laughs> I need to do something about it. I've seen yeah. that for a long time. but uh, You just see so. such huge colonies of it sometimes that I think yep. it can be shocking yep. to people. And you, know? uh, you go and watch that for 10 years and it's going to be down to very little. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I'm I'm having a hard time walking away from the biocontrol conversation because I feel yeah. like that's really juicy and interesting. But I do want to get onto this topic of deer and how they relate. It, I'm getting the impression from what I'm hearing from you that there's a bit of a earthworms from the bottom up and then deer from the top down effect on our ecosystem. So could we, especially for people who, I guess there's a couple things that people maybe don't realize. One is just how abundant deer are. I think we tend to imagine that there would be less deer now than there was, you know, pre-Columbus, which isn't true. Um, and I don't know that people realize how well deer do around people. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can maybe describe the, what the situation is with deer right now. And then yeah. also, it seems to me that when we talk about conservation, and especially at the implementation level, we're typically talking about the entities that regulate wildlife for hunting. And so there's been so much emphasis on deer. Um, and yeah. And it almost seems like what we've done is is grown deer at the expense of the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, so anyway, and, correct me if I'm wrong there. No, Jump in, talk I, I think I think you're right. It may be a little tricky in Maine, right? Because you have this distinction between urbanizing areas and rural areas with agriculture, and then deep forests mm -hmm. uh, where deer interact with moose, or um, so. Um, so that's that's a little tricky because I also understand there's pressure in Maine to make more deer for hunters to shoot more deer um, and maybe even doing silviculture to have more deer. But lately uh, we've been issuing a surprising number of doe tags. In yeah, fact, good. And, now, and the state yeah. actually just started to, for the first time this year, they're selling the leftover doe tags that don't get claimed, which is, the, it's, I've never seen that before. Okay. And, and they sold quite a lot of them. And I was initially really concerned, like, hey, whoa, what are we doing here? We've yeah. been very careful with our herd management. And yeah. now it seems like we're really turning it up a little bit. But as I learn more, I think, oh, maybe this is actually the right move for us. Yeah, so recreational hunting. So here is, <laughs> I don't know whether that's a benefit for you being concerned about shooting too many does. Recreational hunting does nothing to to the deer herd. Really? Uh, yeah. And yeah, your managers will not like that. Some of the hunters will not like that. Um, so, but but think about management in the context of what matters is not how many are shot, but what matters is the ones that are surviving mm -hmm. and what their reproductive capacity is um, and then the capacity to eat vegetation. So coming from invasive species management, um, when we think about, uh, you know, goats or deer or pigs or something that are invasive on certain islands and people that do this for a living, they are not talking about whether they shot 10 or 20 or 100 or 50 their success rate or their success stories are how many survivors are left. Mm -hmm. Very often they want to go and do eradication. Um, and so it's the few smart survivors, or it may not even be a few, that will maintain these populations. So we have studied that here at Cornell and in other places. Recreational hunting will never, ever <laughs> bring the populations down to the level that they typically were. And those numbers are totally unreliable based on like sales of hides by Native Americans to make, uh, I don't know, belts in Europe or whatever. So, uh, but maybe if we believe that figure, it was under 10 per square mile. So, oh, wow. Uh, okay. So what are we looking at now? Oh, typically? Uh, that probably depends on where you are. You course, hopefully yeah. you have some areas in the deep woods where deer are not being subsidized, subsidized by agriculture or gardening yeah. or something of that. Maybe you are close to that. Um, in urban areas here, um, we have 60, 70, over 100 per square mile. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, <laughs> so what we have seen here from recreational hunting, and it's not just our data, but other people that have looked at it, is you get numbers down to maybe 17, 18 per square mile or so. 
So that's more than double of what was there traditionally. And then hunters give up because it takes them so long yeah. to do more. This is even culling programs sometimes. Um, and so that's still way beyond of what uh, uh, the ecological carrying capacity uh, is where other species can thrive in addition to the deer. Um, so wow. that's, that's what we have seen. Um, and so... Um, so for us sitting in a more agricultural area here, um, it's not that agricultural. 60% is forest here in our county. Um, but going a little further up to the lake, it's more agriculture. Uh, and you have a lot of gardens that all subsidize the deer. The deer, the deer have a wonderful time in our urban environments <laughs> and in our suburban environments because it's everything that they need. There are edge species. There's safety from hunters. They know which dogs are on leash or behind an invisible fence. They know exactly <laughs> what's going on. They are very, very smart. Um, and so sometimes when we get in, into into new villages and say, hey, we want to help you with your deer management, those deer don't know what hunters are. So you can kill a whole bunch very quickly. Um, but the survivors, they're incredibly smart. And when they you do that, you're, you're selecting, right? Because it's like you're yeah. selecting precocious animals, yep. animals that aren't really paying attention. Right. And so right. then you're leaving behind the genetics of the more wary animals, right? Well, so they must so get more difficult the, as time goes the, on. The kind of tongue-in-cheek kind of deal that I always say, the dumb ones are in the freezer very quickly. <laughs> uh, and, and so... Um, but again, it's the other ones, uh, the ones that we educate, right? Um, uh, they see one of their herd mates being killed. Uh, they know certain locations that do other things. So we now need to strategize in very different ways on how we can do it. And even with, with situations of, I don't know whether baiting is legal in Maine, is it? No. Okay. So it just differs so much from state to state. Yeah. Uh, baiting is not legal here in New York, but when we do culling, uh, we bait. So we get deer, particular in suburban environments, to safe shooting locations, right? Um, so that we know when we shoot, there's no nobody in right, okay. danger and mm -hmm. we only do it with bows and crossbows. Because the range is so is so different, uh, but 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 anyway, um, so it's 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 impossible even under those circumstances, and it's we're just creating a little uh, empty donut hole that's being immediately uh, recolonized by uh, uh, by deer from the from the from the outside. So at a landscape level, I I have no hope that recreational hunting can do anything, despite what all the management agencies are claiming and what hunters are claiming. Um, and I think we need to go back to regulated market hunting so people have an incentive to go out and do that and think and sell. Wow, you just said something that uh, that's a conversation. Oh, yeah, I know it rattles pages that. all over the place. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, I just got back from, uh, I went out to Molokai, Hawaii this year, where oh, they okay. are just overrun with axis deer. I think they started with six given as a gift uh, from India, um, you know, many decades ago, but now. It must be 10 to one to the people out there. And I've just had never, I've never seen anything like it. And what they yeah. have now is um, a USDA inspector that comes in, um, they do a night hunt and they're able to sell those into the market. Oh, and that's really? given them, yeah. And so- That's new for me. Would you send me some link to that? Oh yeah, I'll connect because you with the folks that, that are doing it. Yeah, That is really almost unheard of for me because the one big thing that people always say is, hey, you know, dear, how are we getting them into food chain? How is it safe? Who is going to be able to butcher them? Uh, and USDA and, and, and butcher regulations and slaughterhouse regulations will prevent that. I mean, we can always change those right but if there is an uh, example in hawaii yeah they, they, they have to demonstrate that the animal i believe what happens is they fly the usda inspector in from another island she inspects each one to make sure that they were shot in the head and or neck and then she has to inspect oh. the organs and if the organs are good yeah. you know and they've got to have the right facility of course for the butchering right and um, but so those are those are typical things right that almost requires professionals right head mm -hmm. and neck shots um, that's not what you would teach a recreational hunter. Right, to, right, right. Okay, yeah. Too small correct. of a target. Correct. Um, but and they're night. They're uh, doing that at night as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but but it's no matter what. Here is there is a precedent then that this was actually being implemented, and of course you would like 
things inspected, right? You don't want chronic wasting disease. You you don't want all these these other things that may affect the deer, and then it gets into a human food chain or even in a in an animal food chain through a, as dog food, some of the leftovers or so, mm-hmm. right? right? So that they're being inspected, that's fine. Um, I remember growing up in in, in Germany, and this was. Uh, you know, there was some food insecurity in places after the Second World War. Um, and my family, when I grew up, always had pigs at home that were then slaughtered in November. Um, and you, for pigs, it's much more dangerous of what gets into the food chain, right? Because mm-hmm. you have human diseases. Um, trichinosis. Uh, that, yeah, trichinosis being one of them. So I remember that once the pig was butchered, you had to alert people before so you would have wasn't usda but it was a health inspector that came in and needed to stamp the pig and needed to look brought his little microscope looked at liver slices and others and wanted to see whether you had larval stages or others Mm. that infected that pig and only after that happened would we enjoy the feast that would come after that right (laughs) Right. uh, so that person was going to all the little home slaughterers because that was done at home you didn't bring it to a facility so you had a person come in the pig was slaughtered at home and then butchered at home but it needed to be stamped so you were safe in 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 that sense and so that's it's interesting so there you have some information for me that i really appreciate because we are constantly looking at how can we implement this here safely uh in the u.s um, I I want to I want to get into what the actual impacts they're having are, but one of yeah. my first questions though is, um, are are you having the issue that the greatest deer density is in the places that are the most restrictive to hunting? I mean, I know here, it's we have our coastal zone where yeah. the Lyme disease is the worst, the deer population is the highest, yep. but you Correct. almost really can't do. you can't hunt there, you know, or it's yeah. very hard yeah. to get any access. And and also the population of folks who own the homes on the coast tend to be wealthy, college educated, much more um, anti hunting in their mentality. And so, yeah. in addition to the lack of access, you also are it's sort of hostile to hunting out there. Right. Um, so, which is kind of strange, right? If you're well educated, you should be aware of some of the things that are going on there. Uh, well uh, educated on edu- some things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> college education, and you become an animal rights activist or an anti hunter. That doesn't seem to be like a straight line for me. But, uh, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I get what you're talking about. They're also very. Uh, cautious about who they allow onto yet their properties right. and others. So we're facing that when we are implementing things things here in Cornell or in New York or um, where I help people uh, deal with some of these issues, right? And so your question was, are the highest deer abundances in the places where we do not allow hunting? Um, and so the answer to that may not necessarily be yes, because if you go to the Midwest or other places where you have high agricultural areas, yeah, the where corn the deer areas, are being huh? corn fed or yeah. whatever, so you can get high deer abundance in those places as well. But typically, agricultural areas are hunted. So then the refugia for deer are really what you described, residential areas, uh, suburban areas where they have all the edge habitat, all the food that they need. And then maybe protection, and the only thing that they need to worry about is cars. Um, and so, um, I think the highest deer abundances are indeed in suburban areas. Staten Island would be a good example, right? So, well over 100 deer per per square mile or so, or even square kilometer. Right. Uh, the places that you describe. Um, uh, we, we see that. So suburbia is deer heaven in that sense. Um, will it be difficult to implement something there? Yes, particularly with the property rights that we see here where people are able to, to do that. In, in, in European contexts, um, I don't know how big you need to be before you are no longer allowed to not allow hunting. So there is, the, <laughs> so I mean that sounds so strange for people yeah. in the U.S., right? right? But in Germany, for example, if you, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's fifty acres. Maybe it's twenty acres. I don't know exactly. But you have to hunt those places or allow hunting on those lands. 
uh, to prevent the agricultural damage, right? So that doesn't mean that you need to allow other people to come in and hunt. You could implement a hunt on your own, but there is a duty to hunt if you want to think about that wow. in that way. Uh, and if you do not, you can be fined. Uh, <laughs> I, I never yes, really – That I, boggles I, your uh, minds in the U.S., I know. It does, yeah. And, I, and I, whenever I've heard the argument – because, you know, there's several arguments that hunters typically like to employ – towards non-hunters and and some of them seem so ineffective to me and one of them has been well if we don't hunt there's nothing to control these animal populations and i've always been like mm, really though i never really thought that about deer but now that i'm hearing this it's like oh but, wow but yeah think, we, we think about really this so the, the hunters are to some extent they are right if we don't hunt what will control the deer population now Cer okay certainly what not is, the wolves <laughs> uh, certainly not the wolves but it will be food availability that controls the deer population now the other thing is do hunters control the deer population that's the big question right they always think oh i go out i shot my two deer uh, that's typically what hunters shoot so i help control the herd once you do that in a more scientific and rigorous sense none of that is true and I will give you two examples where people should think about that. I'm not going to give you the math or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're what we're about here. But you know, robins eat a whole bunch of earthworms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all these earthworms were introduced. What the hell were the robins eating before? But would you claim that the robins that grew up on earthworms actually control the earthworm populations in your yard? Probably not. Yeah, not control them, yeah. Yeah, right? So there will always be earthworms and plenty of them. So the next thing is, from our data that we have here uh, with the Cornell deer herd that was marked, so we understood. We understood the fate of the marked individuals, what were they doing, how long were they living, where were they living, and who killed them all, uh, in the end, right? Our recreational hunters were slightly less effective than cars, vehicle accidents in <laughs> killing deer. No. So, yes, no. the hunters would also all scream, no, that can't be the case. But it is the case. Once you have a marked population, and we know that, you know, deer carcasses litter litter the streets and, 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 um, and, and roads. That's no different in Maine than it is here. So... But think about whether hunters or anybody else would claim that cars control deer populations. Probably Jeez, not. Yes, the insurance companies might. <laughs> well, uh, it's just it's just so little what the damage is compared yeah. to uh, you know human uh, human costs in hospitals or others. Right. But <clears throat> so if hunters and cars kill the same uh, number of deer, the hunters would not say that cars control. The deer right, right, and together, course. neither cars and hunters control the deer population. They take about 40% of, uh, of the deer each year. We have seen that with fluctuations in deer abundance. You need to shoot about 60% of the does in a herd to start seeing a decline. Okay. They never, they never so get to get into that additive mortality, yeah, you need 60% of does in a herd. Yes, to be taken wow. out. Wow. At least 60. And then you will see a very slow decline. So, um, yeah. Wow. And the bucks don't count, as you know. <laughs> right, right. And uh, unfortunately, that's where everyone seems so focused. <laughs> yeah. Um, what What do you see? I mean, I know this is not your area of specialty, but what do you see with uh, chronic wasting disease? And, and how do you think that's going to play out as far as its impact on cervids in the United States? I have no idea of what that end game will be. I just know that, and I don't know how it's being regulated in Maine. We don't have chronic wasting disease in New York, but the DEC, which is the Department of Environment Conservation, that uh, is the um, deer management organization through the Bureau of Wildlife here, they're worried about. Um, and so there are rules and regulations. You can't bring in things from Pennsylvania where you have chronic wasting disease or from out west, um, you know, has to be deboned, uh, trophies, you can't bring a head in other than just the skull plate or so. Um, I work in Wisconsin. I have family in Colorado where I go and hunt elk. Uh, there's chronic wasting disease all over the place. It's actually originated there. So I'm not that concerned about chronic wasting disease and what hunters do with it. 
my concern is with the captive servant head herds. Mm -hmm. yep. And I don't know whether you have them in uh, Maine. I assume you do. We do, yeah. We have some uh, red deer. But deers, that's so. where chronic wasting disease has a field day. Uh, in Pennsylvania, where chronic wasting disease now is in the, uh, in the wild herd, it came in through all those uh, deer farms. In Wisconsin, it's all through the deer farms. In uh, Colorado, where it came, is deer farms and sheep farms. And then it's being spread uh, by th – there is so much traffic in trophy deer, in, in breeding uh, whatever studs or what you have. Mm, right. Deer are being shipped all over the place and then kept at high densities. Uh, that's where chronic wasting disease outbreaks are. And if we really would map where chronic uh, wasting disease is, is in these high intensity herds, high abundance herds, that's where it hits the first. Uh, yeah. It's the same with EHD. Um, What's that? Blue, blue tongue uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, distributed through midges. Uh, it now occurs frequently in New York. Uh, typically, it's much further south. Um, and, um, and so that's a very quick killer within a couple of days. Wow. Um, and uh, so it hits the high density herds. So reducing deer abundance to a uh, to something that's ecologically tolerable uh, and 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 preferred will prevent a lot of deer mortality or safety issues with chronic wasting disease and then regulating the captive servant industry. Yeah, uh, because it the, seems to me that the yeah. that a captive like a servant farm yep. uh, will be bankrupt and gone long before the prions in that soil are gone, right? Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. They'll, the hot spot will outlive the farm operation. Well, they will just kill all their individuals and then it will get new individuals in, right? And so- But I mean, if they kill one on those premises, yeah, like if one dies there, even when they're salivating there, right? This yeah. stuff is stable. Yeah. This stuff yeah. lingers a really long- I joked yeah. the other day, you need a comet impact to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I don't know. That's not my um, my expertise. Prion diseases, but I I've seen, of course, all the uh, um, the the data and what people have tried. Uh, Wisconsin has tried to eliminate chronic wasting disease in the uh, uh, in the areas around uh, Madison, and uh, they failed because people weren't willing to shoot all the deer, right? right. Or you wouldn't have access to all the deer, um, and so. It's spreading now all through Wisconsin. Um, and so maybe the wolves are keeping it in check because they can tell much sooner whether the, uh, <laughs> an individual is slightly handicapped, right? So yeah. that's the one that they can take <laughs> right. out. So, right. um, yeah. yeah. Well, tell us about the – what are the impacts of having these large deer populations on the landscape? Well, the impacts are – dramatic, particularly when impacts accumulate. And so we have had deer populations that are beyond what I call ecological carrying capacity. And ecological carrying capacity is something where deer can live uh, and trilliums can live and wildflowers can live mm. and forests can regenerate just fine. And, and uh, so that's what I call ecological carrying capacity. Deer carrying capacity is much higher, right? Can be a hundred per meter <laughs> uh, per per square kilometer or square square mile better. Uh, that's fine. Um, but so the deer impacts start with eating um, trees uh, that are recruiting. That's probably one of the biggest impacts. That's also of uh, economic importance. And so you have these tall trees, old trees. Uh, that produce fruit, acorns, beech nuts, whatever else you have. They germinate and start growing, and then they get, get about a foot tall. And when you have high deer abundance, they will just mow it down repeatedly. Mow it down, mow it down, mow it down. The seedlings, uh, which which are which are in eventually become preferred hard mast for these deer, right? That's interesting. Right, so. and so, the, but. The, 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 the thing, when we think about what deer do, we need to think about deer, not what they do annually, but what they do over decades and then, uh, mm. and then maybe even centuries. Okay. So it's a very, very slow deterioration that becomes really difficult for people to capture. When I uh. came to the U.S. in 1992, I thought, oh, this is what the New York forests look like, right? 
<clears throat> because I had no idea what it should be like, and who knows what it should be like, right? We had lost the chestnuts and 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 and, and other trees, and it was cut over and and farmed and grazed, and then trees regrew without deer. Um, so who knows what it lo- should look like? But mm-hmm. I didn't have a really a reference point. I still don't have a good reference point, be- point because they're not really old growth forests, so to speak. Um, but if we think about forests, their generation time for trees is a couple of hundred years, red oak, 150 to 300 years. Wow. Um, some other trees may live for a thousand years as an in- individual. So it's it's much longer than a human lifespan. And that's what we need to think about. And that's what the difficult thing is. So those little seedlings that germinate, uh, and then they need to grow up. Um, and it takes many, many years for them to grow and get out of browse height. And the deer are preventing exactly that transition from a, from a seedling that just germinated to a sapling and then in a mature tree. Uh, and in when deer are in lower abundance, they take their preferred ones, the oaks and uh, some of the maples um, uh, and whatever deer candy there is in among, in among the trees. <laughs> um, and then once the deer are in higher abundance and have eaten... Uh, the preferred species, they will take uh, all the other things, all the things that we don't think they would eat. Uh, and once you get uh, a couple of decades that we have seen of high deer abundance, then there's basically nothing in the understory, no woody regrowth, maybe some invasive species, some honeysuckles and some barberry, um, some uh, tree of heaven or whatever you have in Maine. Um, there will be some species, cherries are really not that preferred. I don't know how common cherries are. But uh, all of a all of a sudden, deer will eat everything, and nothing is in the understory anymore. Um, and so you can go through these woods, and even in spring, nothing will grow there. Maybe some introduced species, and I haven't even talked about the herbaceous ones, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, can I just was, mention? Can yeah, I just go back go to ahead. something you said before? Yeah. I mean, you were saying like the the proper way to think about these things is in longer timelines. So 150, 300 years, that's the age of our country. So when you think about, <laughs> when you think about the wildlife management here, it's relatively new in relationship to the age of the country. And then you think about how many different strategies have been employed, how many different wildlife managers have yeah. been able to implement their different strategies over the, that timeline. And none of it's been enough of a time horizon to even think about this problem but, properly. But the, the foresters will tell you, um, I, I don't know what it's German foresters that said that, um, or what are, it's, uh, uh, it's I, so I don't know, it's not me who is claiming the uh, to have originated a phrase that I'm going to tell you. But if you want to look at the future of the forest, you look down mm-hmm. on the ground. Okay, yeah. so that what foresters will tell you, and foresters have complained about high deer abundance um, since Aldo, right? So mm-hmm. that's almost a hundred years ago now. So he has written Aldo Leopold, that is. So he has written about that in high deer abundance, where deer were expanding from their refugia because commercial unregulated market hunting really drove deer almost uh, to elimination in North America, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So they had to be protected. And the management agencies did that really, really well. Uh, And they were driven by hunting interests. Some rich conservationists were all in that. And everybody else wanted to have some deer back on the landscape. That's all fine. It's a wonderful conservation success story. And then it backfired because they were doing it too well, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I we have some property where uh, we had, uh, that we bought and some of the old hunters were coming in and said, can we continue to hunt? And said, yep, you know, after we're done with my bow season or so, you can come in and do something. I'm happy for you to do that, but you need to shoot a bunch of does. Uh, and they said, I can't do that. Uh, it's ingrained <laughs> in me in my education. I cannot shoot a female deer and I cannot shoot a little buck or something like that. I That's can. what they were taught, right? In the hunter education courses. Yeah. And so that, that it's like a lingered. chivalrous approach. To this yeah. Kind of thing, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so the management agencies that were created to rescue the deer from near extinction for them to be thriving again are not well suited to now deal with 
what some people call overabundance. I don't like the term overabundance, but with high populations. And I'm thinking they can regulate that. And they use the thing that they have always done, recreational hunting. That doesn't work once uh, uh, you think about how common are Canada geese, the resident Canada geese? They're probably all over the place in yeah. Maine, right? We, we've got a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, and so again, hunting doesn't help with that. Right. It reduces the population a little bit, but doesn't really eliminate the problem. Snow geese is the same thing. Uh, once, Even with the high bag limits that they That's set. right. Absolutely. It's po- impossible because hunters don't consider themselves as managers. They think about of them as recreation. Once the freezer is full, why right. would they go out and do right. stuff, right? So for the good of the country, no. Um, so so <laughs> anyway, we, we're going back. So that's what the deer are doing, what deer are doing, right? It's not a fault of their own. We took regulating factors out that were... You know, if you have deep forests, no agriculture, no urban gardens, the deer will eat what's there. Um, and but we subsidize them so they don't go hungry. Um, and then uh, in, in in forest situations, they eat all the understory as well: the yeah. orchids, the trilliums, the geraniums, whatever wildflowers you have. They mow down and don't allow them to reproduce. Okay, so um, the herb, the herbaceous plants as well is what you're yes. talking about, and then the cascade must be tremendous from that because of well, all the species that rely on all. I'm of these. sure that people in Maine worry about pollinators, right? Mm-hmm, sure um, so that's probably something that is on the agenda. We need to save our native pollinators. We need to save our native insects. The deer. One of the first things that they do is they take the reproductive individuals, the tall ones, because they don't want to bend down so far. <laughs> <laughs> so they take the tall ones and they take the flower. So they don't take the entire trillium. Uh, they take the flower okay. plus the tops. Well, for the trilliums, they will take the entire thing because they have just have their three leaves on top or so, right? But for some other ones, they preferably take the top off and that's where the flowers are. So then you have the problem that the plants become smaller and smaller and don't flower anymore. So they may hang in there and put up one leaf or two leaves or so. But if reproduction is eliminated, two things happen. One, or actually three things. One, the plant over time will go away because it's just not made to tolerate this for year after year after year after year. They can hang in there for a very, very long time, but at some point they go away. Then they can't reproduce. So no new seeds are being produced. That means once the individuals die that are in existence, there's no new generation that's coming. Um, And uh, so then the pollinators that are reliable or reliant on these flowers, the wildflowers in the woods or at the hedgerows or wherever you are, they don't have anything to uh, uh, to feed on, so they go away. And I'm not talking about honeybees. I talk about the native pollinators right. that we have. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the native insects that would be highly specialized on the tissues of these herbaceous plants don't have anything to live out their lives because all that tissue went into making deer meat. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. so th- this is just, uh, it's a domino effect. Right. None of it intended by the deer. So I don't blame the deer for it. It's our making. It's humans who made that misery. What, and then is this, is this vacuum being backfilled by non-native plants? And do the deer preferentially choose the native species? Um, so it depends. Uh, in, in many instances, it is. But when you go to, you drive through Westchester County or something, or other places, I don't know, you probably have done that at some point. You get closer to New York City, you look into the woods and it's nothing is there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it may be filled in by some invasive wines, maybe some honeysuckles or some something of that sort, some privet maybe. Uh, becomes an entanglement of brushes and others or or introduced species. Yes, that seems to be what's taken over. But being introduced doesn't necessarily mean you are not deer food, right? Clover, um, uh, soybeans, alfalfa, uh, Mm -hmm. lots of things are beautiful deer food full of nitrogens loaded with it. Hunters plant it occasionally, Mm -hmm. right? Just because you're introduced uh, doesn't mean that you're a bad deer food. Uh, in the South, if <laughs> you look, some of your listeners may even look into some hunting shows out of the South. 
uh, people there are hunters in Atlanta and others say love kudzu now because that's where the deer hang out in kudzu and they're eating kudzu. <laughs> Plenty of it. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of it. <laughs> that's right. And the deer, they will change over time and then they will make use use of it. Deer eat some honeysuckle and they eat some barberry. They can make a good living. I don't know how good the living is, but uh, they can they can hang in there with uh, some of the in invasive species. But yes, from maybe a totally empty landscape where there's nothing there uh, to then dominated by introduced plant species or weedy species. Yes, that will be the future of our forests. And the trees will hang in there for a long time until they die and then nothing comes back. Do you have any... Is there anything as hunters that we can do to contribute? It sounds like you were saying before, like it's not, we're not really making an impact and it might take larger scale, you know, implementation of like larger scale thinking like some kind of regulated market hunt. In the meantime, as individuals, I mean, I think for a lot of people, this kind of comes as a bit of a shock. Hmm. And then, um, and then it's like, well, what, what do I, is there something I should be changing about how I approach what I'm doing or do we just kind of carry on? So <clears throat> I don't want to put the burden on hunters <laughs> uh, because, you know, it, as you figured out, I'm a hunter myself. And uh, so I enjoy what I do there um, for the tasty table fare that it provides for the experience that I can have out in the woods or in, in the fields. Um, uh, and I don't think hunters contribute to chronic wasting disease spread. It's the deer farms. If you want some individual responsibility in what you should be doing, shoot as many does as you can. Mm. Uh, but I that. know it's not making a difference, right? <laughs> um, and so if you have, if you go hunt on a farm um, and uh, you would say, I want to help the farmer uh, manage the damage that's there, um, you know, yes, maybe you want, a, a, a buck for the wall or a buck to brag or nice to look at whatever do your duty shoot a bunch of does as well um, mm. and uh, that that's all that i can say will it be helpful not at the scale that we're thinking about right now um and so it, it's difficult for me i appreciate people that wanting to go out and do their thing um by all means do have the experiences um, be out there. Um, don't plant food plots in the woods. Uh, <laughs> I know so many people that do it. I know. I, I, know. I know. I got a friend who puts out a couple thousand pounds of deer feed every season. I mean, it's yeah. just a, a astonishing yeah. what so people are doing. You, you concentrate the damage in the woods around the places where you do food plots, right? So people would say, hey, I'm going to uh, that's an argument that I have heard. If I plant whatever it is, some cover crop with New Zealand plants, with chicory and, and rutabagas or whatever else people put out there, uh, uh, then, then the deer will eat that and not eat all the native stuff that's around that. That seems like an interesting argument. And on the face of it, maybe you could buy it. But once we actually look at it, food plots attract more deer. The deer are concentrated there. They're not just going to eat the things that you planted, but also all the stuff that is nice and tasty in the surrounding of that food plot. So you concentrate and you will create more damage surrounding your food plot than you ever had before. And you make more deer, right? Yeah, more, and you more, more abundant deer, yeah, calories yeah, yeah. means and more. So I, I, I don't understand why it's actually legal to do that because yeah. it's like baiting, right? Just because you have a cover crop in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Or whether you put out corn, the yeah. difference is not that great. And whether, it's, yeah, whether it's above maybe it's the ground easier for you to shoot them. That's fine if it's easier for you to shoot, and then you shoot a whole bunch of them. But that probably runs into problem with regs in uh, in Maine as well, because sure you only does. get so many. Right. And I don't know how many people would say, "Hey, I need to go and buy." 20 dough permits because I have 50 dough on my food plot. Well, up until <laughs> now, we've only, you know, so as long as I've been hunting, we've gotten one deer tag with yeah, our yeah, hunting license. Yeah, and yeah. then lately they, they started issuing doe tags in a lottery, but it seemed like everybody was getting one. Yeah. And then it was started to be like, well, a lot of times I'd get two. And then they started to, like I said, if they weren't claimed, they would sell them. So there seems to be a real uptick. And I guess that leads me to sort of a concluding question, which is um, this all, so you could go out and have a hundred good high level conservation conversations and not hear this stuff. 
particularly what really grabs me is that this earthworm component, the deer component, and then how these all play into the invasive plant issues. Like I haven't really heard anybody ta- else talking about this. So how, what what's the future hold? Do, do, are, are conservationists and regulators starting to think about these things? You know, is this stuff going to make its way in or is it still kind of a long way out before this starts to become part of the conversation that's happening at the state regulatory levels and federal oh, regulatory oh boy, levels? Daniel, don't pull the rug out from under me that nothing will change. <laughs> 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 I have been with this for, for a very long time. Um, and so... But I have seen um, data streams, some changes. Very often it takes young people that are not entrenched. Yeah, inculcated, um, right? And yeah. They say, oh, okay, maybe what we did the entire time didn't work out in the way that, uh, that we wanted. So maybe we need to change our approaches a little bit. And that's my hope. I'm in education. Um, sorry, that's my dog. That's uh, whining here. It. She wants that's to great. go out. But um, so uh, I'm in education because I think we can make a difference with facts and with information. Um, I can't give a presentation or do a, 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 an interview like this and think the world is going to change. It's very slow. People are very hesitant to do that because sometimes uh, they interpret what I'm telling them, that they have been wrong all along and mm-hmm. have been doing the things uh, in the wrong way. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, hey, we discovered things and maybe it's time to change and assess how we're doing things. So I talked about my story of earthworms. So I had a different attitude about earthworms once I learned what they're doing. Uh, I had a different attitude about deer once I learned what they're doing and looking looking into it more. And the more I discover that, the more I feel, okay, we need to collect evidence, but we need to listen to the evidence. We need to be willing to question the status quo. And then if the status quo is not correct in what we're all after, then we need to change the way that we are doing that. Um I see a lot of hesitancy in entrenched interests, right? So whether that's deer farmers, whether that's management agencies that regulate hunting, that don't have the responsibilities for the well-being of the woods in general, but are catering to hunting interests, Um, whether that's individual landowners and the coastal plain that you described said, you know, not on my property, not in my (laughs) backyard. We're all in this together. Um, And... So how we, how we can change that, I don't have the golden solutions. Um, I know that if we are serious about conservation, we need to change the way that we're, we're doing it. We need, to wait at the, 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 we need to change the way that we're managing introduced species, particularly introduced plants. Controlling deer will be the biggest benefit to controlling plant invasions and favoring native species. Um, but we also need to have new ways of measuring that. So that's kind of what I do with my students and postdocs here, trying to find new ways on on measuring. Because if you've lost a whole bunch of things, then there's nothing for you to assess, right? Can't just go out and look and say, "Oh, the landscape is empty. The deer, uh, what, what, were, were the deer responsible?" Some people would say <laughs> yes. Some people would say no. How do you know, right? right so then right. you get into this debate. And I'm sure you have seen that where people say, hey, um, you know, the deer are not responsible for that because I put a fence up and nothing changes on the inside and the outside. That's true, too. If you just put up a fence in Westchester County and have a control area next to it, and we have done that, um, that's New York, outside New York City, um, nothing happens on the inside because the deer have, have sorted out the vegetation already that only those that can live with high deer abundance are now occurring there. Putting a fence around it will not change anything. Uh, but I also don't like the attitude and that you say some people think deer are the cockroaches now of, of mm-hmm. conservation. I hate that. Deer are wonderful critters. Uh, I love to watch them. I love to observe them. Mm-hmm. Um, they are charismatic. They are beautiful. They're tasty. All of those things <laughs> all at the same time, yeah. right? So co- <coughs> calling them rats of the woods or cockroaches is a bad attitude. We need to be concerned about who they are, what they do, but it's our responsibility to help 
maintain them and 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 other critters so that they can live side by side without being bullied out of the system, right? Uh, so that that's where I'm coming from. Um, I don't hate deer. Um, uh, that's that's not where where I'm at. So. Yeah, that, that really comes through. I, I got to say, it's it's not that often that in an hour somebody shifts my perspective so much, but I, <laughs> I really do feel like I feel like I'm viewing everything a little bit differently right now. So uh, I've got a slightly new perspective. I just want to say thanks for that. I'm uh, excited to let that perspective mature a little bit in my mind and sort of yeah. see how you know it where me to where to get a hold of me if at some point you want to talk about biological control or, or yeah. Something. Well, I think I would really like to follow up because there's other there's a lot of uh, other interesting aspects to your work that we didn't touch on today that I think would yeah. be great to, to get you back on at some point and, and talk about. Um, Happy to do it. Thank you. But in the meantime, I'll let this settle for everybody because it's a bit of an eye opener. Uh, okay. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your work. And um, I'll be in touch soon. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me on. People can find some of the things that that we do online or otherwise. I'm trying to do it not just uh, through the scientific literature, but also otherwise. Where do you like to send people? I, I was able to watch some uh, of your lectures on, yeah, on YouTube. Some, some, it's difficult sometimes. Uh, the New York Invasive Species Research Institute has some of them archived, but I've given presentation to like Landscape Fora or the Connecticut Invasive Species Management Group or whatever it's called. So there's there's various places where you can find uh, things. Uh, I, I never Google myself, so I don't, smart, I don't know smart, how to. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> don't start. I'll put some links with the show notes for people so that they can get a hold of somebody. That, that, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your thanks, time today. Thanks and it. happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Likewise. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a podcast guest or topic suggestion, or maybe a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host the Wild Fed TV show for? email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one or two of the Wild Fed TV show, go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 20 episodes. Season three of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2023. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed shirts, hoodies, hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.